Good evening, and welcome to the Old Colonial Courthouse. My name is Peter Kikaro. I'm a member of the board, and it's nice to see everybody here tonight. Um, because we have the air conditioning on, or is it just because you really want to hear what we're doing? <laughs> but uh, it's good to see everybody. Uh, do we have any new people here that, that have been here before? Welcome. I hope you come, we hope to see you more often. Um, after the presentation, there'll be a, a sh short Q&A period, and then welcome you to join uh, us in the boardroom for some homemade desserts that Jude Martin has prepared. So it's a little bit of socialization after you, and plus you get a chance to meet the speaker who uh, has some books out uh, on, on the table. Some of the pictures in the books are absolutely fabulous. So you, I think you'll enjoy that. Also in the boardroom, we redid the map on the wall. We had a lot of pictures on the wall, if you may remember. And we have a couple of these books that explain some of the key historic spots along 6A, along this uh, historic area. So uh, feel free to take a, look at the, take a look at this. And there's a couple of books in there. And look on the wall at the pictures. As you know, this building was built in 1763 and it's undergone quite a number of uh, transitions and some rebuilding. Uh, recently, two years ago, we redid the roof and with some red cedar shingles and secured the, um, we need to secure the envelope of the building. So we're trying to keep up with it. And that's what your contributions coming tonight, paying your admission fee, becoming a member, that all helps support the building. If you haven't picked up a program in the back, there's programs about the rest of the season. So we have a, quite a few good shows that are coming up and I think you'll enjoy it. Our speaker tonight is Anthony Mitchell Samarco. He's referred to as the Balzac of Boston history by the Boston Globe. He's a noted historian and author of over 70 books on the history and development of Boston and he lectures widely on the history and development of his native city. He commenced writing in 1995 in his books, Lost Boston, The History of Howard Johnson's How a Massachusetts Soda Fountain Became a Roadside Icon, Jordan Marsh, New England's Largest Store, and The Baker Chocolate Company, A Sweet History, have made the bestsellers list. Mr. San Marco teaches the popular course, Boston History, at the Boston University Metropolitan College. He has also taught at the Urban College of Boston since 1997, where his courses led him to being named Educator of the Year. He wrote the book Boston's Immigrants for the widely diverse ethnic base of students to use in his course on Boston immigration. He serves on a leadership council. He has also received the Bullfinch Award from the Dark Dames of Massachusetts State House and the Washington Medal from Freedom Foundation, a lifetime achievement from both the Victorian Society and the Gibson House Museum, and was named Dorchester Town Historian by Raymond L. Flynn, Mayor of Boston, for his work in local history. He was elected a fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society, is a member of the Boston's Authors Club, a proprietor of the Boston Athenaeum, and the St. Botloff Club in Boston. He is past president of the Bay State Historical League and served as a corporator of the New England Baptist Hospital for a decade. He lives in Boston and is in Osterville. Is there going to be a test after this? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> the talk tonight is the Spanish flu, a worldwide pandemic. And as we know, that happened in 1918. For a show of hands, do we have anybody that was around at that event? <laughs> Oh, we got a couple in the back. I wondered how many were going to turn around to see. <laughs> Unless precautions are taken, the disease in all probability will spread to the civilian population of the city, wrote Dr. John Hitchcock, the head of the communicable disease section of the Massachusetts State Department of Health, in a circular to local health officials. The disease of which he wrote in 1918 was influenza, currently felling sailors aboard the receiving ship at Boston's Commonwealth Pier. Within weeks, Boston was in the grip of the Spanish flu, or influenza, that affected not just the residents of Massachusetts, 
but was to become a worldwide pandemic. On September 25th, 1918, Mayor Andrew Peters' Emergency Committee recommended that not just schools, but all places of public amusement, theaters, movie houses, concert halls, lodges, and the like be closed indefinitely. Boy, history does repeat itself, doesn't it? Even places of worship were closed, and people feared as the flu struck people of all walks of life. An overworked nurse remembered, it seemed as if all the city was dying, in the homes, serious illnesses, on the streets, funeral processions. By mid-October, over 3,500 Bostonians had died from influenza or pneumonia since the start of the epidemic. Anthony, Anthony Samarco, a noted author and historian, will explore Boston during World War I and a disease that decimated the world population through the Spanish flu. So it's with great pleasure I introduce Anthony Samarco. It's a pleasure to be here. I've driven past this building many, many times, but I've never come in. But I appreciate your coming out on such a warm evening. I've taught now for over 25 years on the college level, and I try to make and engage my students to realize that history is not just a four-credit humanity, that it's something that really you can enjoy. And ironically, last semester, I actually incorporated this into my curriculum, which was teaching the history of Boston. We juxtaposed it, not only from 1918, but to 2021. And I began to realize in some ways many of these students had never even heard of the Spanish flu. But of course, it was all too prevalent with the pandemic of 2021. History is something that is my mantra, and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't read it or write it. I'm doing a book right now on Halloween in July, so it's something that's a little bit different. Though the candy looks awfully tempting, I begin to realize in some ways these are things that are our shared memories. Now, Pete asked you, was anyone around in 1918? But the concept is we probably all know someone in either our family or a family friend that was actually felled by the pandemic. I remember one woman who was my mother's second cousin. She was a nurse and she was at Massachusetts General Hospital and she succumbed to the Spanish flu. It seemed as though everyone knew someone and eventually 50 million people died worldwide. So in some ways, the Spanish flu was a little bit more severe, even though we think COVID-19 was something that was really quite a horrendous 18-month period. But we also realized in some ways that we never seem to realize that pandemics can come and go in such a way that within one century, people can actually realize in some ways that the Spanish flu itself actually began the century as did COVID-19 in the beginning of the 21st century. Now this is a print that actually is one of the most interesting things that shows 1918. In front of a family home, a mother, her husband, and of course their young son stand on the left. But death was taking away their daughter and a child in a perambulator. In a lot of ways it's a very sympathetic, but it's also a very sensorous type building in some ways that we look at this print and realize how things were actually changing. Well, the Spanish flu was something that really didn't touch upon anyone in particular. It went a cross section of the socioeconomic economy, but it was also the fact that it went throughout the country, not only in the United States, but around the world. Now, one of the things about this is I split it into two sections, the beginnings of what was basically Boston and the period of 1918 and 1919. And then I discuss in some ways how the pandemic actually occurred. But one of the surprising things is in some ways, when we look at this, we have to realize that it's actually something that really hasn't changed in 100 years. And during that period, and this is something that I always start the centennial, which was 2018, I had a little bird, and its name was Enza. I opened the window, and in flew Enza. In that instance, it's a charming little ditty, and children are actually playing jump rope. But it was something that children began to realize in some ways that influenza was something that was affecting not only them, their families, but the community at large. 
Now, Massachusetts, in the period of the first and second decade of the 20th century, was changing tremendously. One of the things is Boston's population was increasing by leaps and bounds. It wasn't just by matriculation, it was also through immigration. And between 1860 and roughly the time of World War I, Boston's population increased threefold, meaning that it was close to 2.1 million people within the Metropolitan District. In that instance, Boston itself had expanded tremendously. It wasn't just the Shawmut Peninsula, it was now independent cities and towns that surrounded. Dorchester became part of the city in 1870, Roxbury in 1868, Charlestown, West Roxbury, R Rosendale, Hyde Park, and Dorchester in some ways would all be by 1874. The population was increasing, and of course, everyone looked to the State House during this period as the seat of government. And this building, designed by Charles Bullfinch, was completed in 1798. It was not only a cost of $133.33, but it was something where the seat of not just the governor, but also the House of Representatives and the Senate. By the period of 1918, wings had been added to the new state house. They had actually begun as early as 1913, and as you can see on either side, it increased not just the size of the state house, but it reflected the growth of the population of Massachusetts. Now, in this instance, we have a governor, and the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at that time was Samuel Walker McCall. McCall was a staunch Republican. He had not only served his life in the legislature, but he also had served in the Massachusetts Senate. When he was elected governor of Massachusetts in 1917, he basically would oversee one of the most tumultuous years during the period of not just World War I, but the pandemic itself. He was looked to as the leader where many people would actually seek guidance as well as through healthcare concerns. But there was also the fact that Boston was the city of Boston as well. And I have to tell you, I am so old that I remember when this building was Boston City Hall. Today we call it the Old City Hall. Of course, we have a much larger one on City Hall Plaza. But this building on School Street represented the ideal. It was built in 1863. And not only did Gridley Bryant, but Arthur Gilman create a second French Empire building. And there, the mayor of the city of Boston was Malcolm Peters. He was actually a very well-to-do Brahmin. He kept a house in Back Bay, and he had a country estate in Jamaica Plain, of all things. But he was somebody, in some ways, that people looked to, just like McCall, as not just leaders of the Commonwealth and leaders of the city, but people that actually would represent them. And in this instance, these two men would become critical to the pandemic itself. But what was going on in Boston in that period of time? You know, our grandparents were probably alive at that period. And what were they doing? Well, one of the things is they might actually sit at the frog pond. Seen here on Boston Common, this had been open land since 1634. And if you are a taxpayer in Boston, you own a portion of this. But the whole idea was this was something that was not only showing during World War I the tremendous number of people that were absent from Boston that were serving in the armed forces so that it was primarily younger people, women, and elderly people. Boston was also, at that instance, undergoing the Boston Red Sox triumph. And seen here in 1918, they themselves would be triumphant at Fenway Park. They themselves had started off as Boston's beanstalks. They were a well-known team, but Fenway Park would be built between 1911 and 1912 by John Taylor, whose father owned the Boston Globe. But this was the type of a thing. You saw politics, the Boston Common, even the Red Sox. And you also began to realize that Boston was also a major city on the East Coast where many people departed not just to serve in France and England during World War I, but in this instance for, for ocean liners coming to Boston. This is Commonwealth Pier, and it's in South Boston, but it's now in the Seaport District. It's been retitled. And in that instance, the area has become extraordinarily tony. Wonderful restaurants, wonderful apartments and condominiums. 
But this was built in 1908 to 1912. It was a building that was actually used after they dredged Boston Harbor to allow large ocean liners to come into Boston. Boston Harbor was not quite as deep as one would have hoped, but in this instance, two liners could actually be on either side of Commonwealth Pier, and seen here in a postcard of the period, and Henry Keyes was the architect, a fairly well-known architect. You would have a bridge in the foreground that connected you to Summer Street in Boston, which still survives, and the building throughout that period was, again, a major embarkation uh, terminal for people going to Europe as well as the World War I soldiers. Well, in that instance, Boston was changing. Boston's population was huge. But one of the things was that after Armistice Day, we realized many people were coming back to Boston. After the deployment of many of these soldiers, as well as the Navy, coming back from Europe, they would arrive on these huge ships, thousands of men, and we see here they would parade through the city of Boston. And during that period, not only were they jubilant, but there was a lot of close contact. Now, it was thought in some ways that it was either rodents or the fact of the idea of unhygienic conditions that would actually begin to bring the disease to America. And this says that unless precautions are taken, the disease in all probability will spread to the civilian population of the city, wrote Dr. John Hitchcock, the head of the communicable disease section of the Massachusetts Department of Health, in a circular to local health officials. The disease of which he wrote in 1918 was influenza, currently felling sailors aboard the receiving ship at Boston's Commonwealth Pier. They were sick by the time they arrived in Boston. And in this instance, many people who seemed perfectly healthy, who were parading through the streets of Boston, being kissed on their cheeks by women and greeted by family and friends, inadvertently spread it. And seen here with a ship on the right-hand side, you can imagine the number of people that were coming through. Well, in this instance, Boston was only one of the many different terminals that was seeing these soldiers and sailors returning to Boston. But in that instance, it was something that every ship that arrived had between 2,200 and 3,000 men, as well as nurses, on that ship. So that aspect was Boston was seeing this entirely new grouping of people coming into the city and bringing with them influenza. Now in that way, they went through the city of Boston. Precautions were actually given that every man was to wear a mask. And if you look here, they actually wear a mask as they're actually being deployed to the various armories where they would actually stay until they were actually discharged. In this instance, this is Washington Street in downtown Boston. Thousands, not hundreds, thousands of men with masks would parade through the city. Well, in that instance, Boston was becoming somewhat concerned. We began to realize that within weeks of these men returning, Boston was in the grip of the Spanish flu, or what they called influenza, that affected not just the residents of Massachusetts, but it was to become a worldwide pandemic. And on September 25th of 1918, Mayor Andrew Peters' emergency committee recommended that not just schools, but all places of public amusement, theaters, movie houses, concert halls, lodges, concert halls, and the like be closed indefinitely. Well, that's one way to contain it. But not everybody adhered to these. And we realized in some ways that many people would succumb to the influenza. Well, Boston had the Massachusetts General Hospital, which was an extraordinarily expensive place to seek medical attention. But Boston City Hospital, which was opposite Worcester Square in Boston South End, was a place that was designated as a free hospital. It had been established in the 1860s to provide care for Boston's poor. Well, in this instance, within a month, this building was overrun with patients. And it wasn't just people seeking attention, but it was people who were critically ill with influenza that would succumb within days. 
It was something that people began to realize, not just newspapers, magazines, but also billboards that would say, Spanish influenza has endangered the prosecution of the war in Europe. And there are cases in the Charlestown Navy Yard, 30 deaths have already res resulted. Spitting spread Spanish influenza. Don't spit. Well, do you remember the stories of COVID-19? We had to cover our face, make sure our nose, our mouth. The whole aspect was, when I was a child, I always wondered sometimes on public transportation, why is the sign, do not spit? Never understood it. But who knew? Maybe that was what was spreading. Nobody knew. But in the instance here, people such as not only nurses that were trained, but also the Red Cross and volunteers would begin to turn out. And the whole idea was this volunteer force went to not just the Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston City Hospital, but almost every hospital in and around the Boston area. In whites, as well as masks, many people began to realize the only way to help stem the tide was to cover one's nose and mouth. And seen here, many of these volunteers themselves would actually begin to prepare masks. Do you remember the stories of everyone in the last couple of years? A mask had to match your tie or it had to match your blouse. But in this instance, these Red Cross volunteers, and they really went the gamut from young women all the way to seniors, would actually begin to prepare thousands of masks. It wasn't just for the men who were returning from Europe, but it was also Bostonians. Well, sure enough, cases among Boston civilian population soon appeared. And initial cases were reported on or about September 11th. And by September 16th, there were hundreds of influenza cases in the city, causing overcrowding in both City Hospital as well as Massachusetts General. Six cases even appeared at the Charles Street Jail, and countless more Bostonians were languishing in their homes. And a total of 19 victims had died thus far, and within a week that number would jump to 334. You can imagine the anxiety. The whole idea was what was causing it, and it seemed to affect everyone, even prisoners. Now in that instance, many of the men who were returning began to volunteer, not only at the hospitals, but in tents that were set up at hospitals throughout the metropolitan Boston area. It was always thought in the late 19th and early 20th century that fresh air was really good for tuberculosis. So many times, canvas tents would be sent out in some, such a way that patients could actually stay in them, even in the winter. So you can imagine, I'd get well just to get into the warmth. But in this way, we see a soldier helping, again with his mask, a young doctor with a patient. And this was something that we realized there were never enough volunteers for the proximity of the influenza to the greater population. Well, Boston's Red Cross chapter began to actually not only continue to support it, but they sought volunteers, they sought donations, but they didn't have enough medication. And in this way, they not only showed you taking patients either from homes or place of employment, but on stretchers in an ambulance and brought to a hospital. Of course, once they arrived at the hospital, the hospital wards were filled to overflowing. And in this way, these tents would be set up. Now, this is actually the New England Deaconess Hospital, which is still in Roxbury, Massachusetts. But at that time, it was a major hospital that actually began to treat many of the men and women who had tuberculosis slash influenza. By 1918, it was entirely influenza. And these tents would be set up all around the open area because there was nothing within the hospital itself. Very few doctors, very few nurses. And you began to see in some ways that many people simply expired, not just from the disease, but a lack of attention. Seen here at the New England Baptist Hospital on Parker Hill in Roxbury, tents would be set up as almost in avenues or rows. Thousands of people, usually four people to a tent, would actually be housed in open areas. And seen here, not just with nurses and volunteers, 
But you began to realize in the fall of 1918, there never seemed to be enough that you could give to many of these patients to alleviate their anxiety and, of course, their illness. Seen here, the staff of the base hospital in Lawrence, Massachusetts, showed not just doctors, World War I soldiers, but also many nuns from Roman Catholic orders that would actually help in these tent cities. These tent cities would survive not just from September, but almost until May of the next year in 1919. So the whole concept was, would fresh air help? It didn't. But in this instance, the biggest issue was that Massachusetts had been drained of physicians and nurses due to the calls for military service and no longer had enough personnel to meet the civilian demand for health care. Governor McCall issued a proclamation asking for every able-bodied person across the state with medical training to offer his or her aid in fighting the pan epidemic and urging local authorities to close schools, places of amusement, churches, and other places where people gathered. I guess they were trying to be, in some ways, proactive. But it wasn't always actually successful. As I said earlier, the Red Cross was an important feature. And most of these women with the Red Cross on their headband were important features. But they couldn't prepare not only enough sanitary cloth but they could not prepare enough masks. It seemed that by the period of October, it was thousands of people, and that was on a daily basis. Not only did the Red Cross descend upon the city in every single neighborhood, but every city and town surrounding it. And it said that nurses, the call from no man's land has come across. And nurses of America, humanity calls you. What is the answer? Enroll now with the American Red Cross. Now, in this instance, this woman on the right-hand side, stone martin furs and a very expensive, not only looked at the women, but realized in some ways that maybe she was not a nurse and she could not volunteer, but she could give money. And in that way, many people not only gave money, but they also began to become the role models. I love this photograph because that's Andrew Peters, the mayor of Boston on the left-hand side. He himself was not only a rogue in real life, but he was somebody in some ways that would actually have photographs taken of him for the newspaper as he was given an inoculation. Of course, there was nowhere near the amount of inoculation for the entire population. I'm sure that sounds close to home after the last year, too. Well, in this way, by doing that, he served as a role model for the people of Boston, and people began to realize in some ways that there were precautions that could be taken. And one of the very effective ways of spreading precautionary advice was, this man has a placard on the front of his suit, influenza warning, don't talk into my face, don't shake hands, cough, sneeze, and spit into your handkerchief, and stay at home if you have a cold. Sound familiar? Well, in this way, it did somewhat alleviate the plight. And of course, maybe people thought that this would actually help. But Spanish flu was ripe, not just in Boston, but it was spreading around the world. And in this way, this advertisement in the Boston Globe said, Mr. Citizen, you owe a duty to yourself, to your family and your community. Help stamp out this dread disease. If symptoms develop, keep warm. Send for your family doctor. Our dispensing department is at the service of your doctor, and we guarantee to supply him with what he requires to combat the disease. By telephone and express service, every known drug required will be kept in stock. And kindly have your prescriptions left with us. They will be filled with dispatch and delivered to your home. Well, people would actually adhere to this. But the whole idea was that many families could come down with the disease at different times. And this family, standing outside their house, not only wear masks, but do you notice in the very center, the family cat even has a mask. <laughs> I don't think our cat, Lena, would ever adhere to that. She would not do it. But you realized even animals were thought to be able to spread influenza. 
Well, influenza was something that all persons are notified by the presence of this disease and on account of its communicable character are warned against visiting or coming into contact with those sick with it. All persons or sick with the disease are prohibited from leaving the premises or coming in contact in any way with the general public. And all persons are forbidden to remove, obscure, or mutilate this card or to interfere in any way with these restrictions under penalty of a fine or imprisonment. Well, many people did destroy these cards. They didn't believe that the influenza was being spread, but in this instance, it was actually something that everyone began to realize because these placards were not only passed, passed it onto buildings, but on public transportation. And as it says, keep your bedroom windows open, prevent influenza, pneumonia, tuberculosis. And of course, this was part of the Anti-Tuberculosis League, the Board of Health. But open windows meant clean, fresh air, just the same type of a thing by erecting tents on hospital grounds. Well, whatever was doing was something that many people realized was beginning to affect everyone. Boston school officials quickly changed their stance on issuing a closure order. And effective September 25th of 1918, all public schools in Boston were closed indefinitely. And spurred to action by Governor McCall and the request of Woodward, who was the head of the Board of Health, Mayor Andrew Peters appointed a special emergency committee to advise and empower the health commissioner to centralize and command an allocation of the city's health care resources and to interface with state and other agencies. Well, it seemed like everyone was wearing a mask. Cats, young children, young boys, teenagers, young adults, adults and seniors. It was the only way to try and stem the tide. And by that, we realized that these placards, which was by the Commissioner of Health, influenza frequently complicated by pneumonia is prevalent at this time throughout America. The theater is cooperating with the Department of Health, and you must do the same. If you have a cold and are coughing and sneezing, do not enter this theater. Go home and go to bed until you are well. All public places were actually suspect. So whether it was a theater, a church, a place of worship, or a school, everyone had to realize that the time was coming that they had to be closed. And seen here, this is actually from the Treasury Department of the United States of America, health, Public Health Service, influenza is spread by droplets, sprays by nose and throat. This was finally told. And it says, cover each cough and sneeze with a handkerchief. Spread by contact. Avoid crowds. If possible, walk to work. Do not spit on the floor or sidewalk. Do not use common drinking cups and common towels. Avoid excessive fatigue. And if taken ill, go to bed and send for a doctor. And the above applies to also colds, bronchitis, pneumonia, and tuberculosis, all of which could lead into influenza. Well, many people did stay at home. And seen here in a photograph, I assume a staged photograph, the woman is in bed and her child cries. But of course, the family physician is pulled in a hundred different directions because he has hundreds of patients. And in this way, many people without medical attention simply succumbed at home. They weren't even able to go to hospitals. Newspapers were printing every single day and in this way, it would say that police raid saloons in war on influenza. And it says, keep church windows open. <laughs> Stringent new orders are issued for preventing spread of the epidemic. And police ambulances are drafted. 100,000 doses of vaccine is on the way. 1,613 new cases show decrease in city. Downstate hit worst. Well, everyone re realized Keeping the windows open was a great idea, but it didn't stem the tide. Well, this advertisement showed that if you present the disease, careless spitting, coughing, sneezing spread influenza and tuberculosis. It was so important to educate the public that many people were getting 
conflicting ideas and, of course, conflicting aspects of what they could do to actually stem it. Well, people said, walk to work if you could. Not everybody had that luxury. Maybe it was miles away. But seen here on a streetcar, they would actually have a streetcar attendant and a conductor. But these men in the foreground, all with masks, realize that they have to take the streetcar to go to work. Of course, get the anti-flu habit. And in this instance, this placket said, wash your hands before um, eating. And of course, look at the windows. There's a man snoozing with his window wide open. The other one is covered in cobwebs. Influenza, stay out. Well, in that way, flu precautions were an important feature. And by doing these, it began to make people, not just adults, but even children, realize how important it was. It was said that one nurse recalled making nearly 100 home visits and tending for 500 patients during her four weeks of service. Another recalled visiting the home of a very sick husband and wife. The husband died, and the doctor on the case brought his wife to his own home to recover. One never-to-be-forgotten day at the height of the epidemic, this is the same nurse remembered, it seemed as if all the city was dying. In the homes, serious illness, and on the streets, funeral possessions. In many ways, spurious advertisements would also spring up, as if by magic, that if you bought this, you too could actually prevent not only getting influenza, but if you had it, you could cure it. So the ravages of influenza spreading everywhere. Safeguard yourself by using Milton. Well, in this instance, Milton was probably alcohol with a few herbs. But in this way, it shows a woman, don't sneeze, use Milton. And Milton is the best preventative against colds in the head, uh, throat, and similar winter complaints. But as it says at the very top, Milton will effectively prevent the infection of influenza. You cannot catch influenza if you use Milton according to instructions. Well, it was purchased, and it went through thousands and thousands of orders. But if you ate more onions, <laughs> you too could prevent influenza. And as it says, one of the best preventatives for influenza, of course, if you're eating onions, I'm sure everybody would stay away from you even today. <laughs> but carloads of onions will be on sale on siding at the freight station tomorrow, uh, today and tomorrow, and will be sold direct from the car. Well, if onions are good for you, why wouldn't we buy a sack of at least 40 pounds? So whether it was Milton's, the elixir to end influenza, or just plain old onions, people fell for it. Well, in many instances, that public contact was something that had to end. And as you can see, this young boy selling newspapers stands in front of a theater, and the placard says, all theaters closed until further noticed at the request of the mayor. Well, a theater could seat anywhere from 600 at a very small one to close to 1,800 at a large one. And of course, close proximity, one sneezing and not wearing a mask could actually exacerbate it. But by the period of 1918, the Boston death record as a result of the ep epidemic showed that between September 14th and Oct October of 18th of 1918, that the influenza just showed in the city of Boston, not the metropolitan area, 3,075 people. But they also included pneumonia at 800, which was the precursor to influenza. And you can see that the height was September 26th to roughly September 30th. In that instance, this was only the death record. Multiply that by 10 for those that were afflicted and either in a hospital or at home. Well, in this instance, the Spanish flu, or the epidemic influenza, this disease is highly communicable, and it may develop into severe pneumonia. Well, it even showed you at the bottom how to make a mask. The same things we saw on Facebook. And in that way, that mask might protect you from actually somebody coughing or sneezing in your face. Well. By this period. But it's something in a lot of ways to really think about, and of course with the public health system, of how it affects us, how we react to it, 
and how we either accept or deny the help that we're given. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Please. I thought earlier in that presentation you mentioned the vaccine. Yes. How could they have a vaccine like that? You know, we, we looked at Milton, which was probably alcohol with herbs. It was probably something that was to create a calming sense because we would never come up with penicillin until 1924. So what could it be? It could be a multitude of things, but it was nothing that deterred the influenza. They tried plasma, but it was not something that worked. It really didn't. Plasma is fantastic if you're using it sometimes to build a body's immunity and things of that sort. And when you think of immunity by we were given a, I'm sure everyone here was, we were given two shots. And this COVID shot was supposed to create an immunity. They had nothing to do with the immunity. So a lot of these people themselves would not have taken that because the people were dying. And it was also educating the public. And it was something that really was a backfire. Please. He did. Woodrow Wilson was a very interesting man. I mean, in a lot of ways, during that period of time, you have to realize he was actually not well. And he actually had a stroke just months after this and was incapable of being president. And his wife was very kind to become president for him. But he was somebody who really did play it down. But I don't think Boston actually played it down. McCall and Peters were two people that advocated for a lot of the things that we saw, protection as well as the inoculation which we saw. It could have been salt water for all we know. But it was something that the federal government provided billboards and they provided money to the Red Cross. But they had no idea how to stem the tide. They really didn't. Please. Can you talk a little bit about the demographics of this compared to what we just experienced? Well, the demographics of that period of time was something you had to realize. There were many people living in the inner city. Boston had changed dramatically. And by 1918, with a population of close to, as I said, almost 3 million people, many people lived in the north end, south end, west end in very dense, connected areas. A flat, which was usually three rooms, might have seven or eight people. So if somebody's out in the public and brings it home, it affects everyone. But it affects everyone in the building. Right. I was referring to the age of... Oh. It was... It really couldn't have actually been separated by age. It went from the gamut of infants to adults. Is what? Well, there were many, many older people that were affected by it as well. But one of the things is, yes, you're right, there were many children and infants because they could not actually treat them in the hospital at that point. Many of them just simply died at home. So. Well, and that's one of the reasons that it spread so much. Exactly, yeah. Troops, that they were right in the so. And that's a good word, vulnerable, because I think a lot of these people realized how dangerous it really was and they didn't know exactly how it was being spread at the beginning so please was it true that the US government actually um, suppressed the news of the influenza to not have people worry about the war and that's why so especially the same was it's not far fetched and as you mentioned about Woodrow Wilson it was somewhat downplayed but as people were dying I think at that point by the period of the middle of September many people had to realize that there was something that had to be addressed to the public. And though many people were coming back from the war, it was also something that was, you know, it was affecting everyone. So people were, either that or you would have a calamity. There'd be a riot in the city of Boston. So. That's right. Right. 
homicides. That's right. And many people, they called it the Spanish flu, influenza, but... Exactly, right. Please. No. Forest Hill Cemetery, which I'm a trustee of, is a great example. It's a wonderful cemetery, and many of the people at the very beginning could have very polite funerals. By the period of the end of September, there were thousands of people, and they were placed in caskets under tents until they could actually be buried. One of the problems was many of the people walked off the job. They would not bury the dead because they didn't know if they would be spreading the disease through the dead to themselves and then to their families. There were a lot of cemeteries that basically had receiving tombs that was simply filled to the gills. So it was something that many people realized. It says 3,000 people, but there was probably 3,600 that actually did die in that short period of time. That's just Boston, the city of Boston. But you have to realize many of these people were buried in mass graves. So it's really quite horrendous, but it was something that many people didn't know how to address it. Please. So there was a chart, maybe seven or eight slides before this last one, mm -hmm. and um, I found Boston. You said it was in the top third. Yeah. And then I tried to read as fast before you changed it. Oh, I'm sorry. Other uh, towns, other cities, and uh, until I came across uh, that were close to Boston. Or Cambridge and um, and Lawrence. Ah, now, uh, and it could be Lawrence, Kansas. I don't know. But, uh, um, oh, it was Lowell. Lowell. Lowell, not Lowell. Yes. Well, Lowell again, because you had such a preponderance of immigrants living in certain areas. They weren't just immigrants, but the children of immigrants. There was a sense that was it the lack of hygiene? Was it the lack of proper facilities in the apartments and things of that sort? But as you can see, with Philadelphia, it always it goes down to Grand Rapids, Michigan. But the whole idea is it's a cross-section of the entire United States. And it didn't really affect any one group differently, though many young people did die. But it, uh, that was a long preamble to my question. Mm. So is Boston uh, Boston Cemetery, is that Seven or eight. Yeah. And then there, then two other cities I know. Close to Boston. Right. Well, there are many other cities that were huge, but in this instance, you see Boston. But then, if you go down a little, Lowell is Lowell, Massachusetts, and Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yeah. Providence is only forty miles. But you're right. Many of these were inner city uh, dwellers, and in many instances, you had to realize it was information that was being given that they actually could follow, or maybe times they didn't follow. But it was the immigrant base, because they thought that the North End, the South End, the West End was so densely populated that it spread rapidly. And in many instances, that's what led to this mass grave. Mm -hmm. Well, you see Los Angeles, yes. But don't forget, I mean, this is only the weeks of September 8th to the November 23rd, but then you actually have it. And it's Louisville, Kentucky, and Nashville, Tennessee were a little bit more than others. So it was dying out in certain areas rather than that. Any other questions? Oh, please. When you think of Lowell area, there were a lot of factories there. Very much, yeah. Exactly. And I'm sure many people went to work because there was no wage unless one was employed. So. Oh, well, happy birthday. Wow. Tuberculosis, yes. But it was also, yeah. Exactly. And yeah. tuberculosis was highly contagious. But so too was an influenza highly contagious. And I think we realize now that COVID-19 was equally contagious. So. I think that is still today. Great. Still 
Well, thank you. Well, before we depart, I have a few books. I, I've just finished my 85th book. I'm really kind of happy about it. I know, I, I had a financial career for 40, four decades, but the thing is I've been writing for much of my life. So this is a book that I call The Other Red Line, and what it is is Washington Street from Scully Square to the Combat Zone. It's totally outside of my normal writing, but on the other hand, if you can remember people such as Anne Corio and uh, Princess Cheyenne, one, one was a burlesque at Scully Square and the other was a striptease artist in the combat zone, it's really a fun book. But they're $20 and I hope you'll buy one. Thank you very much.